so sorry. No. I'm going to sum up, because it's quicker really. You variously describe him, your father, as someone who creates conflict, searches for enemies, is barking mad, insufferable, unpleasant, miserable, akin to Basil Fawlty, hardworking, controlling, remarkable, incredible, a man who thinks computers um, messed up the world, for want of another word. Um, so, what's your problem? I mean, no, that sounds good to me. That's... I've, I'll stand by all of it, and if he was here, he'd stand by it as well. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a guy who's done it off his own bat from a council house, you know. Yeah. I mean, he didn't have a lot of money when he finished football, but after he made a success of that and started with seven or eight horses, and he's he's ended up owning West Hillsley. If he didn't have a hard edge, if he wasn't a lot of them things, um, where does the drive come from in a person? So, what are his good qualities? What Perfect. he sees, what you get, you know. Um, he's not. He's not kind to me. I mean, he's not lovely and cuddly. He never tells me, but I know he's on my side. Yeah. And um, if, if he's a friend of yours, you, he's a friend for life. And that goes for business as well. If you do him a good turn, he doesn't forget it. Right. He's straight down the middle. We live, we work in a game where everyone's corrupt, according to the punters. But I'd be amazed if he was A, pulling it off behind my back, and B, <laughs> if he was capable of it anyway. <laughs> yes, you do. You, yes, we'll come to that. Um... Attracting new owners, that must surely, in this ever competitive day and age, must mean schmoozing, must mean glad handing, must mean whatever, the networking. Yeah. How good is he at that? He doesn't need it anymore. If he, he says to me, he says, well, if I'm going to train horse, I want to train a horse because someone wants me to train their horse. Right. He goes, I don't have to stand in a bar and, and, or phone, phone up other people. He's, was it, I ain't going to spiv for no owners is what he'd tell you because right. he's A, he's too old for it he doesn't need the hassle of it because if you go you know I can see his point of view you get to an age where look the record's there you know the only time we cross is when the record could be better than it is right. but he tries with a lot of moderate ones that, that really aren't worth in terms of in terms of how you're perceived in terms of how people view you because oh, it's yeah. very statistical now you can look us up yes. and we'd have a we, we'd have a 10% and I know it could be a 14-15% strike rate but he loves winning his sellers and he, he loves winning with horses who everyone writes off and it becomes a personal battle with him. It becomes a, I'll show you. Even when, even when owners aren't paying for it, you know, a lot of owners give up and he goes, well, I'll win with it, give it me. Yeah. Perseverance, you mentioned in the book. Perseverance, because yeah. he buzzes off a seller at Wolverhampton. He loves it, you know, he, he loves winning with a little horse. Right. Um, and it's just a business thing, really. I haven't got a problem with what he does. Yeah. I'm hanging on to his coattails. I mean, we got here because of his... Yes. His endeavours. Yeah. And you've got to be aware of that. But man management, you differ, surely? How you yeah. how you would do things? No, I think a lot of people deserve a bollocking. Oh. I think, you know, to get things done in the instant, you need to have the pressure on on a work morning. You need to get it right. Because if you get it wrong on a work morning, half the time, you go in with little confidence in what you've seen. You go in with little belief in what you're doing. And you also, you're dependent on results. So if someone's not pulling the weight, it deserves it. The only way I do differ is um, some people need an arm around them, and I'm more bothered about the results, whereas Mick gets lost in the process with a slightly angry demeanour, and you're thinking, right, who's this helping here? You know, if you're hammering a young jockey whose confidence is low, hmm. I don't think hammering him again is going to get us results if that apprentice is riding for us, because the first thing he's thinking is, and I knew this through being a very moderate footballer, if you're worried about not doing very well, if you're worried about messing up, I'm 90% certain you're going to mess up. You say, at one point in the book, you say a shaved ape could do the job you, mm. as assistant trainer, have been doing for eight or more years now. Um, that surely can't be the case. Aren't you underselling yourself? Yeah, but I suppose there's a little bit of self-preservation in that. I don't want to be seen as, I mean, I don't want the book to be seen as look at me or a boo-hoo or a, and I'm certainly very con conscious of the fact that I'm from outside the game. But we've got a system here, and most yards will tell you this. You've got a system where things are done time and time again, and the reason that is, is because it gets results. And after eight or nine years, I'd like to think I'm intelligent enough, even though Monty Roberts doesn't call me every morning for advice. <laughs> um, I'd like to think I'm intelligent enough to follow that through. And you say training can be demoralising, but come on, 
there must be highs, even even at your level of, you know, you're not, as you say, you lower down the pecking yeah. order and all that. Well, that's why you do it. You wouldn't do it otherwise. Right. Um, there's no way, if you didn't have the days like we had with Epsom Icon in 2015 with, uh, uh, this year, 2016, with yeah. Sylvester on Derby Day, winning with a homebred from Norman Court Stud. I mean, you know, it's 90% demoralising, but when you have that 10% great days, you know, they go pretty quick, but when you have them, it's, it's like scoring a goal, I suppose, at Wembley. Not that I'd know, but it, it does make it all worthwhile. He'll retire in a box, I'm fairly certain of that. I yeah. just hope it's a long time. Yes. I've got a younger brother, Jack, as well, who yeah. would be far more um, statistically minded. He'd have a far better... I know all of our horses inside out. Everyone, when the season's up and running. I, when, once the yearlings are in your head and they're turned two. I'd know every single one of our horses. Jack, my brother, who's 20 years younger than me, he'd know more or less everyone else's horses as well because he's got that brain. And he's, he's been born into it. So it depends on Mick. Hopefully his health's sound. Hmm. And we'll just keep going as we're going. You say it's... Um, in the book you say horse racing is a, a losing sport. It's introducing successful people to failure. Explain. That was just a terrible day at Haydock when we had one of them days. Um, you know, when you go with when you go with eight to one, seven to one, six to one shots, we had four or five runners. It was a dismal day, it was raining and you've travelled up the M six and you know you're gonna be seven hours late and there's a mate of mine from Preston called Marvin Dickinson. He's a funny stand up comedian. And uh, as we were leaving he just goes, I've just realised what your job is you know, because the owners have been there. I said, oh yeah, what's that? And he goes, you introduce successful people to failure. <laughs> so you've got to know the context of it, do you know what I mean? It's and true. I'm, oh, know. It's, it's horrific when you have them days and you're trying to paint a, you're trying to, well, you know, at least we know it needs six now instead of seven. We've gone to, yeah. you know what I mean? And people have still travelled all the way up there, all, you know, and it's... A long way. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the prime skills, especially at stables like yours, of a trainer placing, simply placing the horse in the right race, not any race, but the right race. And you, your dad's good at that? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'd, we'd over pitch a lot of the time. We'd right. be, you know, we'd rather have a third place in a listed race than a maiden winner, you know, for breeding purposes. We yes. do, we've got a lot of homebreds. Um, we'd often be in without a chance, but they'll run well and get pick up a bit of black type. I mean, if that's good placing or bad placing, if you're a punter, you'd say it was bad placing. But they've got to understand People have got to understand that, you know, owners come in with a different viewpoint from punters in the betting shop, as it were. Yeah. Um, and you can often see, there's a filly that comes to mind, such as um, 60 Sue, grey filly. Uh, we kept getting emails, we were being cruel to her, we were, um, yeah. you know, you shouldn't campaign a horse like this. And I remember she's tough as teak, and we tried to put her in the paddock halfway through the year to give her a break. She stood at the gate right. and sulked. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The rest are having a great time. This filly was a racehorse and she'd have lost condition. She'd have stood there and sulked. And um, we just said, well, what can we do? You know, so we, we give her a canter and try to throw her out. She still stood by the gate. Um, and she was fourth in, I think it was, you can check this up. She right, was yeah, fourth, okay. she was third, so fourth in, in three or mind. four listed races. So we nearly hit the jackpot. Right. But as a result, her record looks dismal. And as a result, on the back of that, um, her handicap rating, even this year, she's gone now, she's left us. Yeah. But she couldn't win off that mark because at two she'd been such a high achiever. Right. If she'd have got black type, it would have been a great training performance because she didn't. Yeah. But hindsight's brilliant, isn't it? Oh, wonderful. Um, all weather, like it or loathe it? It's got its place. Um, <laughs> especially when Volunteer Point wins the, uh, <laughs> the Mayor's Seven Furlong race. Um, I suppose it's. I don't particularly like it. I, I'm not going to knock it because we've got a lot of horses who belong there. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish we, I wish I didn't go to so many all-weather tracks, but that's the way it is. Um, horses, <laughs> horses trained by you and your dad are not likely to be retired to stud at two or three, are they? As is no. happening a lot these days. No. Um, I, I wish we had horses that, that were good enough to be, right. you know, the, the stand. I mean, if you're retiring a... But you understand why it's happening. I understand why it's happening. Do I? I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. So you get I mean, a horse. You get a horse called Yumzane who's in the. You know, he was raced on till he was seven. Yeah. You know, I mean, and if he'd have won the Ark, he'd have been retired earlier. Yeah. Um, and he became. He got a. But he's a successful stallion now, and he gave he gave everyone a lot of pride and, and a lot of enjoyment through the years. 
So, how I don't know. I'd, l- I'd love to be in a position where we yeah, had a derby yeah, winner and you would retire at three and disappoint everyone. How hard is it to acquire such very good horses these days when the, the very best of the very best thoroughbreds seem to be owned by a, a handful, if that, of the same people? That's sport in general, though, isn't it? I mean, I think you'd have 10 internationals on the bench at Chelsea rather than them playing. You know, they, you'd rather have them on your side than, yeah, you know, and, and sport's gone the way of monopolies. Um, I think the 20 grand horses are now 60, not just through inflation, but the, any cracks in any, you know, the, it's everyone's on top of everything and analysis may well have moved on. Um, it's tricky to get them though. Um, and like I say, we had two year olds in 2016, the best, the best, highest rated cost five grand. Can you spot, or, or would be, can you spot the potential? Can you see a, a young one and think? <laughs> I, I sometimes think I can. In the book, there's a horse called Jadu. He's ended up in Hong Kong, but he ran four times at the start of his two-year-old career, and it was like we'd never trained him. He was murdering horses here. You could see, and he was a great-looking horse by Holy Roman Emperor. Cost a few quid for a Holy Roman. He was, I think, it was eighty grand. And you could just see, you could just see the athlete in him. Even, mm. even hacking around the indoor ride, thought out it starts four runs, finished nowhere, hung away from the pack. He didn't even look like he was. He knew his job, and then. He got a rating of 72, and I was convinced he was a 90-odd horse. And he went and won at Goodwood, won that nursery. Yes. And it all came right, and you were right in the end. But um, you can see an athlete a mile off. I can certainly now, in the last five years, because I was thrown into the sport, but you can see a horse a mile off. Um, there you go. And I have a filly out of amazing win. If she's not, a, not an athlete, she's a yearling at the moment, but she just looks proper. But you've got three or four months of... Yeah. Treating a yearling like a yearling, it becomes two and the wheels can easily fall off. What's the best horse you've known whilst working here, do you think? Yumzain would be the best. Um, the most talented was a horse called Sergeant Reckless, who we never got right. Um, we, he used to slaughter horses at home and never transferred it to the track. That's the downside of seeing animals like that. And they make you look an idiot. Mm-hmm. Um, but unless, I mean, I saw him every day. And he could go with any horse over six, six furlong to a mile and a half, and he'd murder him. Summersby, who, who doesn't love Summersby? What are his characteristics? Summersby was great. He was a bit grumpy, um, <laughs> set in his ways. You know, we right. tried when Hen came, when he came from Hens. Uh, you know, we're just yes. well, you yeah. join that and this, that, and the other, and, and he'd be all over the shop. He, he liked his own way. He'd go and do his own work. We had a good lad who used to ride him, um, Raheem. He. Um, he got on very well with him, and we just let him do his own thing in the end. Um, I think some talented people can't conform, and he was one of them. Bossy guest, your dad was right about him, wasn't he? He was, he was. He won, a, he won that valuable sales race at the start of the year, at um, the Tassels race, over six. And I remember the old man said, uh, before he ran in the guineas, he said, we'll run that in the guineas, this is a sprinter. He said, no, he's got class. And we had a bit of a falling out, and he finished fourth in the guineas. And um, didn't quite go on, he's got... He's just, he jarred up and he got very sour on racing if you look at his record. I mean, yeah. So we've, we've had him gelded and he's out in the paddocks here having a winter off and be, being a horse and we're hoping he's a bit sweeter with us this year. I think he's very, um, he's abrasive and he'll tell you what he thinks and if, if you're not getting on with an owner, he'd rather you take the horse out of the yard because he can't be doing with it. Um, we've got, you'd say, and I'm sure you, you, yeah, you can accuse me of saying this for PR, but I think all of our clients, owners, are pretty, we get on pretty well with them yes. in terms of, you know, that they've got to like us as, yeah. as much as anything because not one of us is going to stand back and, you know, kiss backsides and, and say what they want to hear. We're going to want to go our own way as long as they come with us. Henrietta Knight and Mick Channon are not, well, you wouldn't, looking from the outside, you wouldn't think they were natural, in inverted commas, bedfellas. Um, tell me about Henrietta, what tell me about Henrietta? Well, hence, uh, well, obviously, the record speaks for itself, yeah. we're training great steeplechases. Um, Mick was a friend with Terry Biddlecombe years and years and years and years before Mick was training. Um, right. And uh, I tell some stories about Terry, he used to, <laughs> anyway we won't go there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean there was a, there's a, yeah, like you say, chalk and cheese, but then who to put Hen and Terry together? That's true. She does a great job with the jumping, she gets the jumpers right, We she's a 10 minute box drive over to her. We've got a few hurdles here and that, but the proper work in terms of schooling them over fences is done at hens, that speaks for itself. And it's just the time and graft and, and core fitness that we put into them here. They live with us here and what have you and 
between him, Tim Radford, the owner of you know, we've only got four now, but um, and Mick, they, they do all the entries and all the decision making. Uh, right. Harlequin's down at Norman Court, right. which obviously we're affiliated to, so a bit nope. of downtime there. And an old, um, seemingly soft ground favourite of mine, Arnold Lane. I've got a terrible thing to say about Arnold. He Arnold. went to Ruth Cars. Pardon? And he went to Ruth Cars and she ah. phoned up the other day. Oh, no, and, don't. Yeah. Oh, um, no. He broke down in the paddock, bless him. And oh, she was obviously no. heartbroken, and so were we. Um, are you going to put this on? Because it's a bit of a tear one, that one. He was my favourite ever off. And he ran through brick walls for us for six years and he, we thought he'd have a lovely time because Ruth's had several of ours through the years and just a freak accident. So the old boy's gone. Tell me about your best bet. It's in there, isn't it? Um, freakish. Just open up. The, you, you do your entries, you do your decks. And then you go, well, that, that race is cut up all right. You know, this, that, all that sort of thing. It's only when you put the post out in front of you. Hey, you, you know when there's a good thing coming up, but there's very often... On a Thursday morning, you'll open the paper and say to your mate, I think all six of these will be placed. Just the way the race is sat in front of me, I couldn't see one of them not being out of the frame. Uh, I've done that ten times before and ten times since. No good. And uh, the first one got beat called Person. She was on the wrong side of Donny. And then we had five winners. They went five. And I, didn't, I don't really know combination bets. My bet is a £20 each way double. But what did you do for this? We did a Heinz 57, my mate from Newcastle. We did a Heinz 57. I think it was 90 odd quid each. And it returned at 54,500 to one. And we did them, and it was a five timer and a Heinz. So we obviously lost some of it. And we picked up 82 grand between us. And it was a good day because I could send my mum to Mauritius. And she's never got first class before. Wow. You jammy? Yes, lucky. Hey? Lucky. Some of us punt all our lives. I know. We don't have that. I know. I mean, it's, you, you, it's like when you see the Scoop 6 lads on a Saturday, you know. How many, how many lads say in the Scoop 6, oh, I had five or I had four or this, that, or the jockey cocked up on the fifth and, you know, drawn on the wrong side. It'll never happen again. Let's talk about punters finally. I did wet myself at the letter from one punter, your sincerely letter. Yeah, yeah. Most trainers are accused by punters who, whose pockets are empty of... Cheating. Can you sum up some of those emails or letters that you've received at this I stables? Think, I think they're pretty standard, except they just add on you should have stuck to football. Um, you know. <laughs> well, you couldn't train uh, a monkey. Yeah, you couldn't you train prick. a monkey, you, you prick. prick. Yeah, it doesn't actually say what we can't train a monkey to do. But that, that, that does, if, if you see the way our horses are campaigned, I can't actually believe that anyone thinks we're laying horses out. Lincoln, there's Lincoln for you, second in the um, Victoria Cup, one in over seven. And um, was on. Yeah, so, uh, and you're thinking, well, he's second in the Victoria Cup, so we're running him over seven. He does struggle to settle. And John Egan wrote him, and he said, tell you what, he goes, getting this thing to settle is ridiculous. He says, just let him go. He's got plenty of speed. We've been running him over seven since it took for two years. Well, we dropped him down to five, didn't we? And he went and won three in a bounce. Um, that's when horses make you look foolish, you know. Um, I don't think I don't think we're capable of laying a horse. The horse will change his mind and will come and surprise you. Chill with Icon is another that springs to mind. But um, I'm 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 happy when you get the abusive emails that say you're crap at training, you're useless. Absolutely fine because we'll sit in the wagon some mornings and go, should we just forget about you today? <laughs> you know when you just go, what a couple of idiots. You know what have we done there? Being accused of being crap's fine. And I don't cry when you're accused of being bent, but it does that that does irk you because if if it was that easy to be bent and make money, I, you wouldn't be getting up at stupid hours and doing you know and going through the heartache you do. Um, I don't think we're bent. If anyone is, I'm being hidden from it. And as you say, because your dad says that computers fucked up the world, um, your dad wouldn't know how to. No. Oh God, yeah. Could you imagine him logging on to his? Well, the bet, laying on Betfair and that. and it, it's a, For me, it's quite a dodgy thing. I wouldn't even have a Betfair. I, I just think the best thing to do is stay out of that. I'll phone my mate up like I do, and he's got a, I don't know who it is, one of the local, and we do a Heinz yeah. 57 yeah. or a £20 each way double. That's about as much as I have it off, even though I did in a big way once. But you've had uh, ac accusing emails even when you've had a win. Yeah, yeah, you get them. Yeah, you get them. A bit like Lincoln, a bit like, it was King Crimson at Brighton. And uh, he was 25 to 1, it was the back end, you know, he's going to the, going to the sales and there was a five furlong race and uh, he'd only ran about five days before he ran like a, 
around stinking front runner. So it was one of them. End of the, he's going to the sales. Well, if we, he won't he won't go down in price if he runs another stinker. But let's see if we can put it right. He got his own way in front. The race fell his way, and he won by three lengths at twenty five to one. And then you get a, then you get an email saying that uh, what chance a punt has got? Were you winning with an outsider? Mark Johnson's point was regarding Channel Four coverage, wouldn't he? Yes. I mean, I think, I think, uh, I think at the races and and racing UK are perfect. You know, with the analysis, with the with the drifting in the market, with the, I think it got very deep into the betting there. But if you want to bet, I think if you're a punter like your like your lads are, and yeah. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, I think you're going to be across it on your laptop as the as the telly's on. Yeah. I think you're going to be across it on. All of the other spheres, you're going to have ATR if you're proper, you'll have a couple of things, you'll have ATR and Racing UK, you'll be watching all that. And I think it got very bogged down. Channel 4, yes, the betting's going to be there. But my mum, for example, we used to watch the racing when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and she'd be doing the ironing. You know, and I think people won't like it, the punters won't like it, but I think the terrestrial coverage has got to appeal to the woman I think you know oh, oh I like Frankie now we yeah. you know Frankie's a great bloke don't get me wrong but, I, but you often get sick to death of Frankie's and you know the punters want to see the want to see the paddock and the parade room, which yeah. which you will do but I think if give the public what they want but don't be offended if it's not you because mm -hmm. you've got your own coverage do you know what I mean yeah. if people I, I turn off when the hats and the fashion are on there but if that's what the terrestrial if that's what makes them money through yeah. sponsorship that's what they're going to get. Give the punters what they want. Yeah. And we sit here now at the end, coming to the end of 2016. Um, what would you like to see from this yard in 2017? When does it all start happening? The spring? Or February, March? And first February? week of January. First week of January. Then you get the older horses in. The yearlings are obviously going all the way through. Um, you know, Cassia, Harrison, we've had him gelded. I mean... Right. Graham Lee said he was going great in the ledger. He got obviously the Irish horse, the favourite fell over and nearly put him over the rail. Right. You'd love to see Harrison become, become a cup horse. Um, Melbourne Cup would be the dream. Um, but things like that, you, you sit on horses like Cassia, who's finally got a head straight, won a listed race at the end of the year. And you think, well, oh, you know, could you take on the, rather than coming in with a 33 to one shot with the young Zanes of the world, can we go in there with a, you know, eight, 10 to one sprinter? Can we go Golden Jubilee with a filly, you know, can we, you know, and they all, you know, and Harrison are the same. What else we got? Texas Katie? No. No, she's uh, gone. Gone. Um, she's gone. Epsom Tiara? Epsom Icon. Ep of Epsom Icon. You know, wow. she's, she's, she's a 60s icon, same as Harrison. Probably only get better with age, say a mile and a quarter. Um, Opal Tiara, you'd love to keep hold of her. She's in the sales, but she'll go for the right price. Uh, Divine, she's off to the sales as well. We always, you know, we always lose our. Our best ones normally go to the big fish, uh, and you've got to, you got to, you know, we get a few quid, or the owners do, and and we've, you know, we make the place work. We've got six years on the mortgage to keep paying for West right. Gilsley. so. You said you fell into this, and obviously the book details your past careers. Yes. Whether it's stocking shelves at ASDA or famously presenting sports for items for Granada TV and yep. such like. A glorious career. Catalogue of disasters, yes. Could be, you could have been the new Fred Dynage or something. <laughs> I'm um, going bald. <laughs> so, this is it now for you, isn't it? You love it? You yeah, love it. it's a family business. You don't have much time off, although I'm, I'm having a holiday now. But, um, yeah, you don't, you don't look at the clock. You don't, you know... But uh, it feels natural to you now, does it? It feels, whereas you, you've always, you've said, you know, you're not, it just didn't, didn't come to you naturally because... No. I felt thrown it. in, and I felt like a like a like a well nepotism really a way on your mind if if you overanalyze things, which I probably do. Um, yes, yeah, you do. I mean, Can I say you, you know, do in the book? Yes, you, you definitely yeah, I do, are. and that's just part of your brain. It's not me saying I'm going to write a book of over <laughs> over, um, over analysis and paranoia, but that's half the time what I am. But I think if you work for your dad, and if you see what he's put into it, and you see the legacy he's trying to achieve, and what he strives for. I think, and if you have a great day at Royal Ascot, or if you know, if if a homebred like Epsom Icon does that on Derby Day, beating older fillies and winning at ten to one, and the owner is basically in tears, I don't think you want to step away from that in a hurry. You say that the hardest thing you've done was this book. The hardest job you've done was writing this book. Explain. Yeah, um, Why I, sat there, I had three rules. Did it happen? 
do I want people to hear this and basically will my dad allow it? Right. <laughs> but I had, I had to have a checklist of things that I was prepared to say, things that did happen and basically, you know, would it be any, would it be damaging? And I showed it to him and it wasn't, but to, um, yeah, it was, it was exactly how I feel about everything. And it was one of them, I'm not going to do it for owners. I'm not going to do it to make us look good. I'm not going to bullshit. I'm going to say, if I'm down, I'm down. If I think my dad's being a bit of an idiot, I'm going to say it. Because, hey, you know, a lot of people think that there's some sort of fallout or, you know, yeah. it's, it's harsh. But, hey, when you work with your dad, you know, I mean, you, you they drive your blood, you know, you, you you know, and you have a row and you have this, that and the other. And what's harm in saying that you care about it? If, if we've got totally different opinions, oh, I'll say he will ignore me, but I'll tell him what I think and this, that and the other. And, and you're going to have conflict, especially when you want the right things so desperately. And especially when there's so much disappointment wrapped up in the business you're in. Well, it may have been the hardest job, but you've done a very good job. It's an informative read and it's a rollicking good read, which I read in double quick time. Thank you, Vernon.